What is up, everybody? Welcome in to a Thursday night edition of Shout, a Buffalo Bills football podcast. He is Ryan Talbot. I am Matt Perino, and we have been busy mocking our heads off over the last week here, uh, getting ready for this show. Ryan put out a mock draft on Saturday. I put mine out today. We're going to dive headfirst into both of those today. But Ryan, we're T minus 13 days from Shout Live. From two nines, kitchen bar, kitchen bar uh, inside the dome on Whirly Drive. We cannot wait. I went out there yesterday to check it out uh, where we're going to be. They got a great room set up for the live show. Come on out. There might be a special guest on the way. I'm still working on that. We'll see uh, if that materializes. I'm going to keep it a surprise for now. But I was looking at the menu, Ryan, and check out this bad boy. It's called Under the Sandwiches, The Cutlet. Breaded chicken cutlet, roasted red pepper, mozzarella, pesto, and arugula. That's got my name on it for Wednesday, April 3rd at 6 p.m. I'm going to crush it. You know, maybe, maybe they'll rename it the Perino after a few episodes from there. That's the dream, right? But uh, looking forward to that show. Looking forward to talking about the draft because, like you said, we're jumping in. We're talking prospects. We're doing mock drafts. And, uh, you know, first note before we get into any of the picks, 11 picks is tedious. Like, I, yeah, it's a lot. you're sitting there doing that mock draft machine, and it's like you trade a few picks, and then you still have so many left. It was a lot, like you just said. And the funny part about that is we're coming off of years where the Bills were going in with maybe like six. Like if Brandon Bean had made a couple of trades. So then if you trade multiple picks and you end up doing a, a mock with five players, I mean, we're literally doubling that with 10 or 11 players. It, it's kind of wild, but it's a, it's a really good exercise to get familiar with this draft class. We both took it to kind of a deep dive here, our first one. Uh, and that'll only kind of build on itself over the next couple of weeks. I want to start with the philosophy because I, we didn't talk to each other about, our mock drafts, like our strategy, obviously yours came out five days before uh, mine did. And I knew that you traded back, but I want that same route. And I want to start with the philosophy there because trading back isn't something that all of Bill's fans are super excited about, something that I've learned. Uh, and I'm sure you have over the last couple of days. You know, I think the idea of losing that first round pick, you know, it's, it's challenging for some to understand, but from my perspective, at 28, you're really at the back end of the first round. So if you move back, even anywhere around like, you know, 10, 11, 15 picks, you're still kind of in that window of the same tier of player. And I guess that's the idea, especially in a draft where the Bills don't have a third round draft pick. Yeah, that's just it to me. I mean, you sit there and you look at pick 28 when you do these mock draft machines. And we don't know how it's going to turn out on the actual draft night with the first round, but a lot of receivers are off the board when you're doing these mock drafts now. Uh, players you might be targeting on the D line aren't there, and you have to think: Is there a player that you you know that you think Brandon Bean will value with that fifth year option that is going to be someone that can get on the field now, or would it be better to trade back, accumulate another day two pick, so that way you're you're ending up possibly with three top 90 type players when all is said and done after the after night two is over i could see the latter possibility taking shape because this is a roster that you know had a lot of overturn this offseason and they they had to move on from some veterans they do need to get younger but it's hard to sit there and say well at 28 they're going to get this immediate starter why not pick three guys because you trade back you acquire another pick you still have pick 60 you possibly get that third round pick that you lost that you thought you were going to get by a compensatory pick uh, that never came to fruition. And, and now you're loading up on maybe they're not starters as rookies, but they're guys that are going to contribute as rookies, potentially start year two and be a, a, an important part to getting younger in key spots. So I'm going to take you through my scenario first, and then Ryan will follow up uh, and, and go through uh, his trade down scenario and what that yielded in round two. You know, so sitting there at pick 28 in this exercise, Brian Thomas Jr. from LSU is off the board. Texas standout receiver Adani Mitchell, he is off the board. 
Uh, Iowa defensive back, potentially a safety cornerback combo. Cooper DeGene, he's off the board. And then Texas defensive tackle, uh, Byron Murphy, who isn't necessarily a perfect fix. I think he's a little bit more Ed Oliver than one tech. Uh, I don't know if it's the perfect fit, but if he's there at 28, I'd actually think about that only from the perspective of you're almost resetting the clock. You never know what's going to happen with Ed Oliver on his next contract, where you're going to be at with the cap, all those kinds of things. He's, he's a super value right now with where his contract is, but you never know. And I think that they need more pass rushers on the inside, especially considering, you know, how, uh, bad things were past Daquan Jones and Ed Oliver last year. But with all those guys off the board, I'm not really super excited about anybody. I, I think that there's an argument to be made for Xavier Worthy, the, the other Texas wide receiver, but I watched a couple of his games. I think hands are a little bit of an issue with Worthy. I know he runs 4-2-2. I went back and watched the, um, the Texas-Alabama game on YouTube last night, actually, just to look at Mitchell and Worthy. There's a bunch of players on both sides. Um, and... Man, there was a touchdown, a great route run. Worthy absolutely undressed the, the corner, got wide open, perfect um, pass from Ewers, and he just dropped it. I mean, there's nobody around him. And that's like one play, and I'm not trying to extrapolate that and put that on him necessarily, but there, there are some concerns with that part of it. The frailty of his body. Like, there's, there's all those things that kind of go in the mix. And, oh, by the way, he's another potential slot receiver. He can play on the boundary too, but he's not a – a typical X. So, um, which I think is in this draft, that's what I think you should be prioritizing if you're Brandon Bean. So I trade down and then I don't even go wide receiver at 36. I go defensive tackle um, to Vondre Sweat, who was so impressive down at the senior bowl. I know he is huge. It's out of the, and you even wrote about this in your mock draft. He's out of the usual parameters, the bills value a defensive tackle. But Ryan, I think we need a little bit of a departure from the usual line of thinking there. And so I like the size. I like the potential of what that means for Ed Oliver. So I pulled the trigger there. I hit wide receiver at 60 with Troy Franklin, who we've already talked a whole bunch about. And I know a lot of people push back like Troy Franklin at 60. No way. Do you know who Troy Franklin almost like, if you look at the profile, the resume, it is almost completely identical that to that of Tennessee's Jalen Hyatt from a year ago, he was getting mocked to the bills in the first round for a lot of draft season. Where does he end up going in the third round? Speedy, a little bit frailer body can win on the deep ball had a actually statistically better season than Troy Franklin. Uh, so I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that uh, Franklin goes late second round in a draft where there's all of these risers at wide receiver. Yeah, so starting first with Tavondre Sweat, one of my favorite players in this draft class. Love uh, the size, love what he did at the Senior Bowl, and I think he can be a very fun player in this league. But as you mentioned, the Bills haven't done that in quite some time. Had a, a guy 350, 360 plus pounds clogging up the middle. Should they consider it? Absolutely. If they think this is the best guy on the board, if this is a a uh, person that can clog up the running lanes, can make life easier, can show a little bit, even in terms of getting after the quarterback or uh, getting some pressure, pushing back on the O-line in, in terms of the passing game too, by all means. But like you said, it goes away from what they've done under this regime. Uh, I don't know how many snaps you could have him play. I don't know if he is a three-down starter. I don't know if he's more of a uh, you know, a two down type of guy per series, those, those run plays early on, you pull him for someone else. I have some questions about him, but love him as a prospect. If the bills end up with Tavondre sweat, I would be uh, all on board with that move. So, and then when it comes to Troy Franklin, I mean, I, I think that you made some really good points in terms of uh, comparing him to Jalen Hyatt in terms of this is a very, very deep wide receiver draft. And, you're going to still see a lot of receivers go off the board in round one, which means there'll probably be a few receivers that fall a little bit on day two of the draft. A lot of receiver needs have been met by some of these teams. They're going to start going to other positions. There'll be one or two guys that fall that maybe you weren't anticipating. And I could see it being Troy Franklin. Uh, Franklin it does have the appeal in terms of being that outside receiver, the speed factor. Uh, the Bills having a private workout with him shows their interest there. They had a formal with him at the Combine. So connecting the dots there makes plenty of sense. So in, in terms of your haul and those first two picks, uh, like them a lot, love your next pick even more. 
Well, we'll get to that uh, round three <laughs> in a minute. Let's go back to the Ryan Talbot seven rounder. Uh, take us through the scenario that you worked through, the trade that you pulled off, and then what you landed in the second round. Yeah, so same idea. You get to the end of round one. You look at the board. Uh, the, the receivers that you think Buffalo would potentially be interested in are not there. Um, even in, in this case, you, you had both Texas receivers off the board. Uh, you had Lad McConkey off the board. I mean, you were probably talking a reach at receiver at 28 if you were to stay there and go that position. Defensive lineman, there, were, there was one or two D tackles there. Uh, Newton out of Illinois was one that was there, which he's been mocked to the Bills a few times. Um, you know, I'm not opposed. I'm not, you know, for I, I'm whelmed. I guess I'll, I'll use our friend Bruce exclusives term from our last show. Not overwhelmed, not underwhelmed, just whelmed with that idea. So looking at the prospects, looking at what was available, I thought a trade down uh, was what was best for the Bills. Uh, looked in terms of teams that had some extra day two picks, the Packers. I, I see the Packers as this team that realistically had the 49ers on the ropes in their playoff game this year. Should have probably beaten the 49ers. Uh, they, they have a pick before the Bills in the first round, but if they love two prospects and they can get two first-round guys, two guys with that fifth-year option on a young team, um, maybe put them over the top of the NFC, they might want to trade back in. And uh, it netted the Bills two day-two picks. Uh, so I had them landing 41 and 58. The Bills did give up some um, day three picks along with pick 28. Which is and okay every, because they have 107. They have 100 of them. And, and it's funny because some people said, oh, I like that trade. Some said, oh, you gave up too much. I don't, I, the, the mock draft, you know, trade chart that I looked at had the Bills ahead. I know there are some that would have had them behind. Uh, you just don't know what teams are using these days. But I use the 2024 draft chart. I tried to an analyze it all together. But uh, at the end of the day, and I see some names here, uh, Latuada UCLA was also gone in my mock draft at 28. He's another one I would have potentially taken if I would have stayed put. So I think Latu, now. just to, to chime mm -hmm. in on that, I think Latu is one of those guys, if he's there at 28, if I'm the Bills, I really heavily consider making that move because I do think that there's a drop off after those three or four edge rushers. And yeah. I don't even know if all of those edge rushers fit into what they, they want to do. Like chop Robinson, like the more I read up on him and watch him, I don't necessarily know if he's the kind of archetype that fits what they right. usually look for. Yeah. And I saw a mock draft today in CBS sports and they had the bills pass on law to and take an offensive tackle at pick 28. And oh, come on. Not I even tackle. Like, like uh... I don't, I can't see tackle at this <laughs> no, point. No, I can't either. Not in the first round. I mean, you always want to stock up. I know Spencer Brown's had some injury issues, but he's coming off his best year. And they and they noted that. But, you know, seeing Latu go a pick later was like, oh, that, that would have been the pick in my opinion. But anyways, uh, I had the Bills trade down. Pick 41, I looked at the best player available. And on that uh, list of players, it was Tyler well, Newman. What were the three players available? Set this up for me. The three players three available. Oh boy. Hiding through. I'm trying to remember now because it was since Saturday, and I really should have taken a screenshot of who was on the board. But N Tyler Newbin, in my opinion, was by far the best prospect of the of the names that were available. And I am not a get a safety with the first their first pick. And that is not the the boat I thought I would be in in my first mock. So it goes to show you. Um, just how much better I thought he was than the other prospects that were sitting there at pick 41. So, you know, Tyler Newbin to me is the best pure safety in this class. Uh, Cooper DeGene, you mentioned out of Iowa, some teams see him as a corner, some teams see him as a safety. I don't know how the bills view him. Uh, but if they view him as a safety, maybe he is the top safety on the draft board. But in terms of pure safeties, Tyler Newbin out of Minnesota is the guy. I think he comes in. He immediately starts over what the Bills have here. I know that, you know, they signed Mike Edwards. They have Taylor Rapp. They have Cam Lewis. I think Newbin leaps all of them uh, to claim one of the starting jobs. I think he's that much of a difference maker. The Bills have a, a big part of their defense in Sean McDermott's tenure has been the safety play. And he that's also a reason why he was so appealing to me at that point. The Newbin thing is super interesting because, man, I cannot get a gauge on this safety class that the more I dive into it, the more I get 
uh, really overwhelmed with it all because, you know, some people like to your point, Newbin is high up there. Some people are on uh, Bullard out of Georgia. Mm -hmm. um, I was reading Nate Tice's big board and he doesn't have a safety listed in, until I think 44. And it's a, it's a kid out of Wake Forest, Mustafa. Uh, who I'm not hearing anybody else talk about as the, as right. his top rated safety. And I feel like the, when you get into the weeds, like a guy like Nate Tice to me holds a little bit more weight because he was an evaluator coach in the league. Somebody that, you know, has been around, knows a lot. It has a lot of friends in the, in the league. So I feel like um, I kind of take that with a, not, not to downplay Jeremiah who did it professionally. He's mm -hmm. great. Um, D uh, Dane Brugler, who's awesome. And actually today, shout out to the athletic football show. They did, they just dropped their, the draft for dummies because Robert Mays is like me, like doesn't even start looking at the draft until like February, March. And so he brings on, uh, Brugler and, and obviously Tice who does a lot of scouting as well. And they, they just go through this entire, um, draft situation. So the safety position, I'm really unsettled on the bills going that route in the first two rounds, not to say that that wasn't, there wasn't value there, especially if the bills think the way that you do in that Newman is a potential difference maker. If you find that guy, you, you pull the trigger. You don't worry about the number where you're getting them. You go and get that player because I think getting him involved um, or, you know, getting him in place is important. I just wonder if you talked about defensive tackle and, the, the history, how the Bills traditionally approach that position and going for a big, heavier defensive tackle like that is a departure. I think it's a departure from what they've done. And obviously it's easy to say because they've had Poyer and Hyde, but they've never really valued high-end draft talent at either of the safety positions. I mean, right. they, they started this whole thing with two guys that were basically castaways. Yeah, I, I, I think Micah Hyde was a pretty good player in Green Bay. But... I, I get your sentiments and, you know, part of maybe why, again, they've never really gone after safeties is because you have Poyer and Hyde and uh, how good they were over those first few years. But it's going to be interesting to see because I do think they're going to come away with the safety maybe within their first four picks in this draft. I, I think that's a fair uh, estimate uh, of where I could see them taking one. And there are some good ones. I see, you know, some pretty uh, savvy draft analysts here. In the in the chat, uh, Cole Bishop from Utah is a, is another safety that I really do like that I think you could get in the third round potentially. His uh, RAS score was through the roof. Yeah, it was, and I did see someone mention Mustafa David Highland. Uh, Oladapo when he said, "I think we could get them in the fourth or the fifth. and you know that's what makes it so interesting. One guy has Mustafa as their first safety. Some say fourth or fifth round value, so it, it will be interesting and. If the Bills do go defense, it'll, it'll also be interesting to see if it isn't defensive line because that is probably where the smart money is at in, in terms of what they would address first on that side of the ball. So go ahead. No, so you go get um, – I was just going to set you up. You go get Newbin and then you come back at 58. Yeah, come back at 58 and get Xavier Leggett. And uh, I saw someone talk about your mock draft today on Twitter and say, oh, that's the guy I would go get. And you made uh, a good point. Uh, what was your, your top criticism of Dave, uh, Xavier Leggett? So I like everything about the kid. I think he's a super competitive guy. And I think that there's super value there where you got him. The one concern is like the limitations as a route runner. And I think like this guy that you get in this draft, it, you know, whether it's day one or day two, to me has to be somebody that can get separation. And I like that about a Donnie Mitchell. I like that about Troy Franklin. Uh, I even like that about Xavier worthy, even though I have you know concerns about um, the catches, it's what takes me out of the Keon Coleman uh, category because there's concerns about his ability to beat press man. I think you need, that's one thing that I feel like, although he wasn't a nuanced route runner or somebody that even got loads of separation, Gabe Davis had this like crafty way about getting open down the field. And so maybe it's, I don't, I've not seen enough of Leggett. One of the other criticisms I've seen is like, he didn't play a lot of snaps before this past year, if I'm correct. Right. Like, no, that's one true. First full year of, uh, you know, of a sample size, but where you get him and the way people are talking about him, the way that Jim Nagy talked about him down at the senior bowl, I have no problem with the pick. Yeah, I'm high on him. He's one of the my guys at receiver, and A.D. Mitchell is my number one guy at receiver in terms of players that I would love to see the Bills get. So We're when, when I'm saying, in a minute. yeah, when I'm saying my guys, I I'm not considering those top three, even four receivers 
Uh, I think even, you know, Thomas Jr. now is well out of Buffalo's reach at this point in time. So with guys that I don't see the Bills getting unless they make this massive trade up, I'm talking about guys available. So Mitchell's my top option. He would be a round one person. Xavier Leggett on day two is a guy that I really like quite a bit. I wouldn't call Keon Coleman my guy, but I, I feel like the 40 time that he tested at, which was terrible, um, it doesn't show what he actually plays like on the field. And he showed that in the drills where he was like the second fastest receiver uh, at the combine running certain routes or the third fastest running this route. He plays faster than he runs in a straight line. So if the Bills do end up with Keon Coleman, I know there's going to be a lot of fans that would be upset with it. Uh, but I think that they would have seen him on tape and what he can do on tape and know that they're confident in his ability uh, to play at a higher speed than what he showed at the combine there. Kind of similar to, to when uh, – and, and Gabe Davis didn't run that slow. But when, when Brandon Bean was kind of openly hoping that Gabe Davis would, would run a little bit slow on his 40 years ago at the combine because it was a player that he loved, uh, I, I could see that being with some of these guys like, ah, they, maybe they don't run fast in the 40 but they play a lot faster on the field. But for, you know, going back to mine, Xavier Le Legat was my player in round two at uh, 58. And then I came back two picks later, Matt, because I'm, you know, still at pick 60 at this point. Rook or, uh, or Horhoro out of Clemson. I probably butchered that last name. He is a defensive lineman that I think fits what the Bills have been looking for, can play on the inside at defensive tackle. Um, again, tested off the charts with the relative athletic score. Uh, I wanted to go with Sweat in round two, and I kind of was hemming and hawing on it. And I talked to uh, our buddy Joe Marino, uh, and Joe's like, "Yeah, Sweat's a really fun player, but he doesn't fit that the what the Bills generally do there." And, and after that conversation, some consideration, uh, I went that route with the Clemson D lineman over Sweat, who I could have had in with one of those second round picks. Yeah, and I just I, I wonder if there isn't. You know, I get what the ideology has been, but I think a lot of times you have to think about, okay, what's set up Ed Oliver for the most success? And I think like, you know, Jordan Phillips, I know that he's a little bit more athletic, but his size in 2019, you know, was great for Ed Oliver. And it wasn't just like, he wasn't a space eater. It wasn't the same kind of idea. And I think he was only like max 320 maybe 325 but he's huge he's like a big person um and, and i think just like adding that kind of player it's something i've wanted going back a couple of years when they when they when they were um when i was pushing for them to draft aleem mcneil who's turned into an absolute stud and that's the thing about sweat that i think is intriguing everybody wants to put him in like this bucket of like he's a little bit overweight like, will he ever be able to lose some? Like, how do you know? Like, you only know that if right. you're in the room. And I think that you're making this draft pick if you're Brandon Bean, knowing the kid based on the conversations that you've had on with him, the scouting that you've done inside the building, that all those things are going to have to check out. But I just like the idea of like a big bodied guy to really cause a ruckus in there. I think Jordan Davis, for all of his faults, I think he's somebody that's really added to that defensive line for the Philadelphia Eagles. And I think getting a guy like this that has this athleticism that, you know, was so dominant and in mobile, we know how much they value the senior bowl and what yeah. Jim Nagy has to say down there that that stood out to me. Yeah. And, and rightfully so. And if they do make that shift this year, uh, I'm all on board the, the sweat train. I, I think that he has high upside. I, I think that he makes it tough to run. Uh, for opposing teams and you know like you said you can coach uh, players up you can try to get them at a l lighter weight perhaps uh, to get keep him on the field and those are the conversations that I'm sure they would have with the prospect during these uh, interviews that they met with them at the senior bowl or if they have them in if they do something with them a virtual whatever the case may be uh, if they show that interest they're going to do their due diligence to try to figure out the best case scenario for him. All right, let's um before we move on to our picks in the third round, um, I want to talk about Adani Mitchell for a second because one thing that I'm really chasing over the next six or seven days, we get a chance to talk to Brandon Bean down at the combine or at the uh, owners' meetings here this weekend. And I want to kind of dig into this with him a little bit, uh, if he'll bite. There seems to be this sentiment, and I guess Dane Brugler mocked. Mitchell to the Bills, but had the caveat that he doesn't really fit into the mold of what the Bills typically like in terms of like, 
you know, known to maybe take a few plays off here and there, maybe doesn't have that. The work ethic doesn't scream. And, you know, I was listening to Nate Tice, of course, obviously a big fan putting him over. He's been on the podcast before. And he was like, I'll mock him to the chiefs. No problem. Because I know that no matter what Andy Reid will get guys to buy in and get the most out of them. I think the bills need to evolve into that. Like yeah. I know that they want like a certain caliber of person inside their building, but what good is building a culture? If your culture can't rub off on the players that you're bringing into in house, you need that skill set. You need that talent. And to me, Mitchell, if he's there at 28 or maybe even in a scenario trading up a couple, like I think you should get all aboard that train because that to me is like the missing piece to their offense. And I don't think you could concern yourself with like those small little minute details. You got to just see if at heart you think that he can be amenable to the culture and then bank on that and, and bank on your own system. Right. And, you know, real quick, my only pushback on the comment about the Chiefs that he made uh, would be, you know, they traded for Kadarius Tony and they haven't been able to get the best out of Tony. Uh, Sky Moore, no character issues, no taking plays off. It hasn't really developed there either. So, you know, there's something to be said that the everything's not perfect in Kansas City in terms of the way that they evaluate and draft or trade for these receivers. It just helps when you have a franchise guy. But that's where where the line or where the comparison is. The Bills do have a franchise guy at quarterback that can get the best out of his players. Uh, so I, I agree with the mind shift of we, we don't need players necessarily at this point that um, are you know those those Boy Scouts or those those guys that are always going to be given their best effort. I don't mind taking a guy that in college took a playoff or two because he knew the ball wasn't coming his way. Uh, in the pros with Josh Allen, you, you learn quickly that a play that might the ball might not be coming to you if Allen has to scramble and get out there in the open and keep a play alive, it might be coming to you and it might be coming to you 40, 50 yards down the field. Uh, so he'll learn pretty quickly. So I agree that at some point you do have to start looking at these players from a talent perspective, not just a um, an all around perspective of what this player's done in college in the past. And I don't think it's a major red flag if they're taking the playoff here or there. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to get into um, the third round and beyond in this mock draft. One of the questions in here is uh, about Ricky Pearsall. Uh, nice, nice uh, wide receiver from Florida. My, my problem with Pearsall and Lad McConkey and Roman Wilson, who was mentioned from Michigan, the Bills have those already. Like, I feel like they have Khalil Shakir. They have Curtis Samuel. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a lot of ways, they have Stephon Diggs, who's a similar size and build and kind of like style of receiver. It's not a perfect comp. I'm not saying that, but I think you're looking for the bigger, faster, like X style receiver in this draft. And that's why I think like guys like Leggett uh, or Leggett, however you want to pronounce it, guys like Brian Thomas, Donnie Mitchell, Troy Franklin to me is, is a better fit. And, and that makes perfect sense because like you said, it, it's nice that they have these interchangeable parts that they currently do with digs um, like they do in, with Khalil Shakir, a play, play on the inside and on the outside and Curtis Samuel. But, you know, you might want a true outside receiver to kind of throw into the mix as well, a player that you can try to develop uh, that Joe Brady can say, this is one of the, this was like in terms of their skill set, perfect for the offense I want to run. And, you know, that doesn't always pan out, but I would rather than take a risk on a, on a player that they feel like would be a great fit that is truly an outside receiver. Maybe doesn't have the versatility uh, to play on the inside as much as these other three receivers that the Bills currently do have uh, can do, but I'm, I'm on board with that as well, where let's go out and get a guy that is a true X or a true outside type of receiver. Uh, all right, let's get into this third round here. Uh, I will start, and the Bills – traded back, which got them an additional third round pick. Then with their first pick in the fourth round, they traded back up. So I have two picks for the bills um, here in the third round. And I will say, I don't think I mentioned this look out for the Washington commanders uh, where the, when the bills are at 28, mm -hmm. uh, when I, when I traded back to 36, it was with the commanders who there's, there's like a group of tackles. And I was talking to my cousin or uh, my brother-in-law, who's a huge Washington fan. Obviously, they're going to get the quarterback at number two. So I thought, okay, they're probably not going to trade back into the first round. But if there's a potential tackle there, offensive tackle, 
they don't, they're not very good there. So to me, if that, that last guy, I think it's a Marius Mims uh, from Georgia was the last in that, at that group of first round caliber tackles, maybe that could coerce the Washington commanders to come up. Then um, when I come back into the third round, it's a deal with the bucks who have, Picks in the third round, like within six or seven of each other, they had a day three pick, uh, and the Bills get back into the third round. So here are the selections. First off, I go with cornerback. Now, I know I gave Mel Kuyper a hard time for going cornerback in the first round. Listen, if it's Cooper DeGene and you think that he's going to be a, cor a corner in the league, if it's Kool-Aid McKinstry, like, I'll listen to that. If that's best player available, that's fine. I was more right. fun at with Kuiper and you put the story up on the website, it's like, first of all, it's TJ Tampa who like he could end up being a third round pick. We don't know. Yeah. That's a little bit off the beaten path. And number two, he set it up like, okay, the bills lost Jordan Poyer, and Micah high, their top two safeties. And I'm going to give them a cornerback when they have two starters already in place there. Yeah. It, it was baffling. It was frustrating uh, with the first pick. The, the rationale made absolutely no sense. But for the Bills, I mean, in terms of adding a cornerback, yeah, it's going to happen. I think that's something that they do every year, and it's a smart thing to do. Add a cornerback or two uh, to the mix, try to develop them, try to make, you know have them start out here in, in Buffalo as potentially cornerback three at the highest. Uh, cornerback four, realistically, uh, is in play. But compete for one of those depth spots as a rookie. Get them the, the reps, though, throughout the year in practice have them come in year two and compete. So, but to, to take one in round one, especially one that I don't know necessarily is a round one pick uh, was very confusing by Mel Kuyper Jr. And I, I guess Tampa is another one of those guys that has some of the safety flex, like pe evaluators aren't sold on whether or not he's going to be a corner or safety at the next right. level. So I get it, but at 28, a little bit too rich for my blood. Max Melton, cornerback out of Rutgers. I take him at number 78. Uh, the reason being, I kind of went through every scouting report of cornerbacks in this range. And to me, he's the best scheme fit. What worked the last time around? The Bills finding Christian Benford, who played a lot of zone in college. Um, one of the main traits that's kind of harped upon in Melton's scouting report, and he might not be there available in the third round. Uh, you, you know, you never know how this thing goes, but it's his off coverage. It's his you know, his ability to react and, and, and some of the uh, production that he had at the college level while playing in a zone heavy scheme. To me, that really jumped out. I think I uh, got excited about it at that range. I come back later in the third uh, and then finally do address, address safety. Uh, pick number 92, Cameron Kinchins. Talked quite a bit about him. Safety out of Miami. Really bad combine for him. The testing numbers, the RAS score. It's not where you want it to be, but listen, there's so many things connecting this guy to the Bills, starting with Jameel Adai, the new Bills cornerbacks coach, was his DB's coach at Miami. I think the number, the testing numbers aren't as important with this position, and Kinchin's, you know, proofs in the pudding. 11 interceptions in two in his last two seasons at Miami. He's, he talked about how instinctual uh, he feels that he is, and that's what the, the Bills, I think, are looking for. And at 92, uh, there's real value there in Kinchins as, like, the I think it was the fourth safety off the board. Yeah, and Kinchins was the prospect I was hinting at earlier, saying that I loved in your mock draft. And, you know, you said it well. Uh, he didn't test well at the Combine, but the instincts are there. And uh, at some point, you got to trust the instincts over the, the testing numbers. It's great to have someone that tests off the chart and fly around, but if their instincts aren't there, uh, what good is that going to necessarily do for them? And the instincts are there. It showed up in college numerous times. He has a relationship with Jamila Adai. Uh, definitely a player that should be on Buffalo's radar. I will say that other than one year, the Bills have drafted players for the most part with really good RAS scores, the uh, the, the relative athletic great scores. And this would be going away from that. But you're also taking stock in a coach that you hired this offseason, his word on what this prospect can do, how he could fit. And as much as I would like to see, you know, a safety, a rookie safety get into the mix and start immediately, you wouldn't necessarily ha have to do that with Kinchins, uh, with Tyler Newbin, who I drafted. It, it, you likely are high on Mike Edwards. You're likely still high on Taylor Rapp, who 
I do think played very well down the stretch. I thought he had some rough moments early on this year, uh, but when he was needed more on the field, I thought he looked more comfortable out there. So they could go with veterans and ease these younger players in. So, you know, high like both of the picks that you just made there on uh, with your round two selections. So you don't have a pick in round three in your mock. Well, so Rook, okay. yeah, but I already talked about him. Say again? Uh, Rook there at pick 90 that I mentioned. So I did have – wasn't he – well, maybe he wasn't. Maybe I'm No, he was at 60, so you got, got him in the second 60. round. So, no, yeah, still no thirds for me. Uh, so I'm going to jump to the fourth round. Um, and a cornerback that I really like based on what I've seen from him, how he fits, Dwight McGothern or Glothern. Uh, out of uh, Arkansas, played a lot of zone cornerback, played at a high level, graded really well in that area, uh, like a 90 overall grade from pro football focus in terms of zone cornerback play, 91.8 overall type of grade. Um, in terms of what we've seen from them at the cornerback position, makes a ton of sense. I think he's a player that like I said, you know, the Bills are already set at cornerback one and two. They're set at nickel. Uh, but you could bring him in and you'd feel pretty good about him. Maybe even in, in, you know, year two, taking on a bigger role if they move on from Rasul Douglas uh, because he's entering the final year of his deal here with the Bills and, and go that route. So someone that I really like in terms of the skill set now. We don't know what the bill if the Bills are planning any changes at cornerback position in terms of do they want to run a little bit more man? Do they want to mix it up a little bit? If so, that might change my thinking, but we probably won't know about that until after the draft. Uh, I don't think the Bills are going to come out and say, ah, we're thinking about making changes X, Y, and Z to our defense. They're not going to give any bread uh, crumbs to the media or obviously other teams, but uh, the, the Arkansas prospect makes tons of sense here in terms of what the Bills have done in the past at corner. Yeah, all that sounded great, Ryan, but we all know why you picked him in the fourth round. Um, your favorite show, The Office, <laughs> Dwight K. Schrute, uh, Dwight McGovern. Uh, there you go. Uh, it, it all makes sense. I get it. Um, all right, so you go with him at 144, and then you come back at 160, which I believe is in the fourth as well. Mm -hmm. Zach Zinter, guard yeah. out of Michigan. Tell us love, about it. Love Zach Zinter. I uh, had a pretty nasty injury late in the season against Ohio State, but it was a clean break, three-month type of rehab process, All-American. Um, you know, it doesn't jump off the charts in terms of the athleticism, but I think that he is someone that can be a high-level starter at guard in this league. I think you're getting good value for him in the in you know at, at pick 160. I was very happy to see his name on the board in that mock draft at that point. Uh, a player where we've talked about this, the Bills have a little bit of uncertainty on their O-line. We, we, you move Connor McGovern from guard to center. You're expecting David Edwards to maybe step up and claim that spot. I think he's going to have first crack at. I wouldn't be shocked if he's the starter there week one, but I wouldn't mind having a guy like Zach Zinter waiting in the wings, uh, uh, the prospect out of Michigan that could potentially – take that job because I think he's of an eventual starter in this league and a long-term starter in this league. Round four, I went with uh, Penn State center uh, Hunter Norzad in the same uh, kind of ideology that you just kind of laid out there. They traded Ryan Bates and they released Mitch Morse. And I know they're moving Connor McGovern over there, but there's some question marks about the depth uh, behind McGovern. And maybe you want to start developing a center uh, this season or get somebody with some position flexibility. I don't know if he necessarily fits that mold, but the big thing for me with him was the athletic part about his scouting report. Uh, I think it was Lance Zerline over at NFL.com noted how much Penn State was able to get him out in space, have him pull, kind of get downhill a little bit. I, I think that fits perfectly into what uh, Aaron Cromer wants to do. Uh, I come back at 144, and I want your thoughts on this one. Uh, Third-ranked uh, college football uh, rusher when it comes to touchdowns uh, last season, Audric Esteme, uh, if I'm saying that correctly, running back out of Notre Dame. Love the player. One of my favorite ones in this draft at the running back position, and it's not a strong running back class. Perfect fit for the Bills in terms of what they need. They need – that short yardage guy. And, you know, he doesn't test athletically off the charts. Mm -hmm. um, he's not someone that you expect to get the ball in his hands and rip off a 60-yard run. 
But if he does get by that first line of defense, you'd be surprised at what he can do. Uh, he, he had some tough yardage situations where at Notre Dame where he, he was able to shrug off an arm tackle attempt and, you know, from that point on, pick up big chunks of yards. He was very, very good at what he did. He would be a great compliment to James Cook. I still like Ty Johnson a lot, too. I think your running back room is set with an Audric Estime. Uh, I, again, in, in terms of the value, love where, where you got him. He wasn't available to me around that point, or else he would have been in high consideration for me uh, in my mock draft. So that would be a, a great pick. I can't call it like a home run pick, but in, in terms of what the Bills need, it's a home run in, in that perspective. Uh, and then I come back uh, at 160. Again, we got a lot of picks here to get through, everybody. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, and this one was arguably my most popular pick in this um, mock draft. I went with wide receiver, six foot six wide receiver Johnny Wilson out of Florida State. Absolutely massive. He's still kind of learning to play the position. He's very raw, but like the potential that he's kind of flashed as a blocker, I'm thinking the Gabe Davis mold, like fifth round draft pick. He got size, the ability to get downfield. He's not a super burner, but I think he plays faster than even his 40 time, which I think wasn't bad. I was like four five two or something like that, which I think Gabe ran a four five six, if I'm remembering correctly, or somewhere in that that rate region. So I was looking for that kind of fit. And so I, I found uh, with Wilson, I think that's somebody that they'd be excited to develop. And, you know, this is a team that drafted Gabe Davis and then Isaiah Hodgins a couple of years ago. We know this is kind of like Brandon Bean's flavor at this stage of the draft. And I'm shocked you didn't get pushback. You said that was one of your, one of your more popular picks. Surprised there were, wasn't the uh, Justin Shorter hype coming after you saying, how dare you? <laughs> that's going to be his role, sir. Uh, no, in, in terms of what the Bills have done and looked for in terms of those blocking wide receivers, makes a ton of sense. Raw prospect, a player that you try to develop, you hope that uh, he comes along as a receiver as well as a blocker. We've seen not just with Gabe Davis. Last year they signed Trent Sherfield in free agency. He was the highest uh, graded blocking receiver th the year before that in Miami. They bring in a Mac Hollins this year in free agency, another veteran receiver that's known for blocking. So they are always looking for players that can contribute in that regard. So uh, makes a lot of sense. And, you know, shifting gears, I'm at pick, uh, what am I at? 190 something, 189 now, 189. I also go receiver, but I do not go big, massive receiver that can block. Uh, I go with a familiar family name for Brandon Bean, and that's the McCaffrey family. And I have them select Luke McCaffrey out of Rice. Uh, same thing, though, in terms of the development. I like where he is as a player after two years playing receiver at Rice. He had a really great season uh, in his final year there. He is converted from the corner uh, quarterback position. Excuse me. I like players that, one, know what the quarterback's thinking, and that's one thing that you're going to get out of McCaffrey. Two, you know the bloodlines are great, the McCaffrey name. Um, and very, What's the very relation? Is he cousin? To who? to Christian brother yeah. brother okay brother yep sorry yeah so it's it's his younger brother um think that he is a prospect that in terms of raw ability not knowing all the nuances of the position yet uh, I could see Bryn being rolling the dice on him finding creative ways to use him as a rookie not just you know uh, keeping him stashed away but trying to get the ball in his hands because of how talented he is overall as a prospect. So that's the route I went. But again, I think you and I both agree doubling up at receiver in this draft uh, would not surprise either of us. So at 189, I go with an edge rusher and I find an absolute athletic freak out of Texas Tech. And my, the more I've learned about the player since this has come out, I don't think he's going to be there at this spot. So the Bills would have to go maybe earlier. I might even consider this in the fourth round. Um, the production wasn't great career high eight, six and a half sacks last season, but his RAS score at nine, nine, two ranks 14th out of 1,685 defensive ends since 1987. So you're talking about just absolute, um, freakish, you know, uh, speed explosiveness 
uh, size, all of that stuff. He didn't do any agility testing. Um, but Miles Cole out of Texas Tech, I think I, I think that's an exciting player. Uh, and, and the value to get him at this stage of the draft, I thought was too much to pass up. Love the pick, love the position, love the raw athleticism. Um, uh, again, maybe different picks in our drafts, different players, but our heads are in the same place again in terms of uh, prospects and what they can do. But Miles Cole would be very high on him as a prospect. Um, my only problem, and not with Cole, just in general for the Bills at this point, if they don't package some of these late round picks, I think they, they might fall into the same problem that's happened the last few years. I know there's more openings on their roster, but they get these guys late in the draft and they can't find a way to get them onto their roster, sneak them onto their roster. And they end up getting poached instead of being stashed on the practice squad. And, and a team's going to love Miles Cole in, in terms of the the raw athleticism. So I that's my only problem now, just in general for the Bills, when you get to these day three picks, I almost wonder if they have to come up with a better plan, whether it's packaging some of them, uh, trading one away for a pick next year, kind of kicking the can because you have 11 this year. Well, let's get another one for next year instead, because I'm afraid of what might happen once again, where these round six, round seven players end up getting claimed by other teams at roster cut down time. And when you look at the testing numbers of a Miles Cole, uh, that leaps off the page. But same thinking here, Matt, in terms of position, I go edge rusher. Uh, I go back to the school of the great Arthur Motes for the Buffalo Bills. Uh, James Madison, this player's name is Jalen Green. 15 and a half sacks this year. Mm. Small school, uh, but really tested, uh, really played well, performed well. Looked like a, ma a man among boys there. Still projected to go on day three, later on day three, because of the competition, because of the lack of production before uh, this season. But a, a player where you're sitting there saying, who can I get production out of? And we know what the Bills have done in years past with these smaller school players, whether you're talking corners, safeties, whatever. They have a knack for finding talented players at these smaller schools developing developing them getting the best out of them so jalen green stuck out to me at pick 200 the one thing i want to push back on a little bit is what you were talking about a minute ago and i don't think you're wrong like i do think that like you you chance losing players when you draft a lot on day three with not a lot of roster uh openings and then you end up cutting them but the one pushback i'd have to that is like if you look over the last couple of years the players that have felt fallen into that category haven't really gone on to do much. Like I think of guys like um, uh, who was the wide receiver a couple years ago out of Houston. Uh, that's now I think playing in the XFL. Um, oh, his name is escaping me right now. He was the speedster out of Houston. They took him in the fifth round. He played with Ed Oliver. It's oh my blank gosh. I know Jack, but like Jack Anderson's another example. He's bounced around from a few teams on the O line. Marquez like, Stevenson. Oh, Marquez. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Speedy. Um, they call him Speedy. Yeah, Speedy Stevenson. And then it was, uh, thank you, uh, Michael Silva uh, in the comments. Oh, a bunch of people coming in now. Stevenson, <laughs> Stevenson, Stevenson. Best fans in the world. Um, and then um, another guy that comes to mind, remember Rashad Wild Goose? I oh, yeah. There was some, Jets, some feelings about him up. when he got caught. And, He's kind of just bounced around the league a little bit, and we'll see what happens with Alex Austin. I mean, he started for the Patriots late last season, and uh, Nick Broker is a guy last year. But I think, like, if you have a bunch of swings on day three, right, and you get him inside your building and you kind of learn a little bit about him, and now you have all of these years where you've had some guys that have worked day three, like the Dane Jacksons, the mm -hmm. you know even undrafted Levi Wallace, the uh, Christian Benfords. Uh, I know those are all on the uh, defensive side of the ball, but you have all these examples – then there's ones that, you know, you were, you know, you had, you were forced to let go, went on and didn't really do anything. You can kind of, you know, read those situations a little bit better. And if you land a five day, three picks to Christian Benford's in this class, it's worth to me taking those swings, get them in your building and trying to figure it out. Yeah, no, that's a fair pushback because of all the success that they've had on day three, going all the way back to uh, a Matt Milano type of player. Uh, looking at what they've done the past few years on day three, finding valuable contributors and depth players, and in some case, players that have come in and started. So, you know, it makes sense. But again, just to what we we're talking about, they've lost a lot of players too. And you're right, none of them have gone on to great fame or, or great success. It's just that's the risk that you run 
when you have a talented roster like Buffalo and you have all this co these collection of day three picks like they do, especially this year. So I have two picks left. You have two picks left. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me go through mine real quick. Then you hit yours. And then I want to quickly touch on Mike Edwards before we get out of here. Sure. Um, pick number 204, I believe. It might have been 203. I might have just written this wrong. Uh, the Bills select Mason McCormick. Uh, he is a guard out of South Dakota State. Tons of college starting experience the last three seasons. Uh, again, huge Raz winner. Uh, I don't know if he'll be available at this spot, but if you're talking about a developmental interior offensive lineman at this stage, McCormick is an absolute home run. And then, you know, I gave Sean McDermott a little treat in the seventh round defensive tackle, Logan Lee, uh, out of Iowa undersized guy kind of reminds me of Harrison Phillips a little bit in that way. Uh, but also like Harrison Phillips, uh, state wrestling champion, uh, at 285 pounds, his senior year of high school, Oh man, I could just see Sean McDermott <laughs> in his singlet just getting all amped up watching the uh, Logan Lee tape. I was just going to ask you what was his record at, in, as a wrestler when you said I got a present for uh, Sean McDermott. So I knew, I knew you went with the wrestling background. Now, like both of those picks in terms of you know taking those shots on the dart board on day three for me, pick two hundred three, MJ Devonshire out of Pitt. The Bills have a history taking pit defenders on day three. You look at Dane Jackson. You look at DeMar Hamlin. Uh, they like those members of the secondary. Devin Shireman with the Bills informally at the Combine. Good depth option. Good depth uh, in terms of the competition that he can bring during the summer months. And uh, a player that if you, you know you can't find a roster spot for, if, if you can retain him, develop him on the practice squad like they've done with some of these other young cornerbacks over the years. Pick 248. What's better than two punters, three punters. The Bills currently have two guys under contract. And mind you, when I when I made this pick also, I didn't know if Sam Martin's contract was going to be guaranteed or not this season. It hadn't locked in yet. They had signed Matt Hawk, which made me think maybe that was kind of a power play to say, hey, uh, let's let's renegotiate or let's you know change the numbers around here. But they end up guaranteeing that contract. But Austin McNamara out of Texas Tech. Uh, showed off a big leg at times for Texas Tech. Uh, one of the better punters. I would probably say the second best punter in, in the draft this year. You can get him in late with in round seven with your pick. You know, bring him in, add some competition because once again, I, I like Sam Martin. Definitely not a long term answer there. Uh, I know Matt Hawk is not a long term answer at punter. So if you feel like a guy is there that can be the answer, he did some holding at Texas Tech. He showed that off as well. Uh, at the senior bowl. So I, I think McNamara would make sense from the punter perspective if they're looking. I think you did almost a whole minute on the punters. Oh, yeah. What I'm going to clip that out, tweet it out. It's going to be through the roof. Through the roof. I'm going to get a light. From, I'll, I'll get a light from Reed Ferguson. He, he likes my take on uh, Kane, so he'll like my take on punters. That is, that is actually a really good take, and I, and I respect uh, Reed Ferguson and his uh, – um, commendable efforts to try to bring canes to Western New York. I will definitely get up on that. All right. Um, last, uh, but not least, um, Mike Edwards. So the bills brought in, uh, two safeties last week for visits. Um, they brought in Colts. Uh, his name is escaping me now too. Um, the Blackman. safety from the Colts who, Oh, Blackman, Julian Blackman. And then, uh, Mike Edwards from uh, played in Kansas city last year. Uh, I was more on the Blackman train. Um, but after getting a chance to talk to Edwards and he kind of feels like a guy that's never really been given a chance to start anywhere. Uh, he's always been like the third safety and, um, in, in all these different situations. And I think that they think he's number one, um, got a nose for the ball. He's got all of these turnovers. I think his numbers turnover per snaps is one of the tops in the league over the last five seasons. Um, I don't think he's necessarily going to be a starter. Um, <laughs> oh, Talbot. You got, <laughs> you got jokes. All right. Ryan sending me text messages and I told, I tell them all the time comes up on my screen. <laughs> and that's why when Caitlin does it, I tell her, don't do that because if it's something funny, it's going to make me laugh on the screen. Um, Anyway, so Mike Edwards is in the mix. 
I'm not I'm not writing him in pen on the depth chart as a starter. I think it's going to have to be earned. Uh, I think the numbers came out a little bit over $2 million. Yeah. Uh, so he could start. He could start with Taylor Rapp at the current stage, but I think you still want to try to get a safety in the draft. He, yeah, he's fine. He's dependable. He's, you know, looked the part when called into action. Chiefs ran a lot of three safety looks uh, where he was on the field and when they needed him to play a little bit more due to, due to an injury, he was okay. He was just, he was adequate. He was fine, but he can be moved around in a lot of ways. And I, I think that the uh, bills like him for that reasoning, the ball Hawk part, like you said, second most defensive touchdowns in the league. Uh, since 2021, I believe eight interceptions over the last two or three years, uh, predicted he'd have two defensive touchdowns this year in Buffalo. He's right in the mix of that, you know, safety two, safety three conversation. Uh, I still think it would be better if the bills could find someone early in the draft to take one of those starting spots. But if they have to run him out there, I think that he is a, a player that has the instincts. He's shown that at times when given opportunities, he fits a lot of what the Bills are trying to do. He adds some versatility to that defense. And for those reasons, I was more than okay, especially at the price point that they're able to sign Mike Edwards at. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, thank you so much. Hit that like button, subscribe as well. A uh, ton of action over on X, Twitter, uh, whatever you're calling it these days. Uh, over a thousand watching live. We appreciate all of you. Um, everybody come out to... Um, Two Nines Kitchen Bar inside the Dome on Whirly Drive, uh, April 3rd, 13 days from tonight. We're going to do a live episode of Shout. We'll be hanging out. Uh, I went in there yesterday. That The menu is just spectacular. They have TVs everywhere, and they actually just put up a huge giant screen uh, that you'll be able to watch whatever games are on uh, that night. Uh, basketball, maybe they'll have some baseball on at that point. Yeah, baseball's coming. Maybe that'll be it'll be definitely be going uh, by then. Um, it's going to be a great night. And one more shout out: become a shout insider right now. Just text seven one six five two eight six seven two seven. Uh, you get yourself a two week free trial, three ninety nine a month. After that, gives you access to Ryan Talbot, Matt Perino, every day, any day, anytime, with all your bills, questions, uh, anything you want to chat. I was actually having a back and forth today about my mock draft with a couple insiders. Uh, we, we roll up our sleeves. We get in the weeds. It's a, it's a fun uh, experience over on the shout text line, which is brought to you by Carrie C. Byer attorney with the law offices of Francis M. Litro. They're located at 237 main street in Buffalo, New York. If you or someone, you know, seriously injured, give him a call 716-852-1234 or check out Litro law.com. It's a mouthful, Ryan, final word, final word. Uh, Duquesne, congratulations. First NCAA win since the 1960s today, representing the A-10 well in the big dance. Look at John Robert coming from my throat. He said, make this sound better, LOL. Well, John, we all make mistakes, okay? <laughs> I had to click over a little button that would turn the microphones on. Forgot to do it. You know why? You know who I blame? I blame John. I mean, I blame uh, John over at Wingnuts. Got me, uh, got me going on the IPAs pretty early. I think that might have been the problem. That might have been. Um, it. Anyway, guaranteed audio will be back in a big way. Thank you so much for watching. We appreciate a big hour long episode of Shout on your Thursday night, getting you uh, into the weekend. Uh, we know you're just busting, John. Thank you so much for watching, and we will see you next week. Take care, everybody.